Okay, so this is the Selangor paper 2, uh, set 2. Okay, set 2 punya paper. Now, because we have already discussed the essay questions are so many times, uh, uh, you know, in various, various videos, I want to try to answer the entire paper 2 in one sitting. Uh. So, I don't want part 1 and then part 2. Uh, because part 1 and part 2 means I waste a lot of time, you know, doing this one. Uh. I feel that I have spoken enough, uh, about okay how to answer the question how to answer the question so uh, we're just going to straight away give the answer uh, i'm going to straight away give the answer and we we'll try to finish the entire paper today lah. okay and uh, we'll try to finish it in one and a half hours lah, okay if i don't talk too much <laughs> okay all right question number one lah. uh sorry again lah, this is selango paper two Okay, Selangor paper 2. Huh? Now, given an equation relating the photon energy E and the frequency like F, okay, e equals to HF, this is obviously quantum physics. Lah, okay, punya topic. Huh? So, what is the meaning of frequency? Frequency is a very standard one. Uh, it is the... Wait, what's happening? More Sorry, hold on. There are people coming in. Okay, frequency is... Uh, Jangan getaran sesaat, sorry. Uh, the number, okay, the number of vibrations per second. Okay. I, I remember this definition more in Malay lah. Bilangan getaran sesaat, berbanding dengan English. Vibrations per second, number of vibrations per second lah. Okay, that's the definition of frequency. Now complete the following sentence. H represents uh, either Planck's uh, constant or the De Broglie's constant, okay, so it's obviously Planck's constant, lah. okay, so Planck's constant uh, is a very standard one. The unit for H, if you look at the formula E equals to HF, we know that energy, even if it is photon energy, is joules, okay, and then frequency is hertz, okay, or second minus one. Lah. So when you move, move the, the units around, lah, you will find that H is either joules times second okay or joules per hertz okay so any second minus one pinda pergi sebelah kan dia akan jadi times lah so it's joules second or if the hertz pinda pergi sebelah dia jadi bahagi kan so it's joules per hertz lah okay either one of these will give you the correct answer Okay, what will happen to the photon energy if the light energy frequency increases? This one is very logic. If the frequency increases, obviously the energy also will increase. Okay, again, reminder, the, what will happen? The standard three answers. Okay, question number two. Diagram two shows the Earth, the Moon, and the satellite. There is a gravitational force that is acting on the Earth, Moon, and the satellite. Okay, so, yeah, so what is the meaning of gravitational force? Now, the standard meaning for gravitational force is a force between two objects. Okay, uh, that, that is a standard meaning. Lah. Of course, some people will say force is like, you know, uh, upper gravitational, no, sorry, it's gravitational acceleration. Yeah, that you try to connect it to gravitational acceleration, lah, which you don't have to. Okay, actually, basically, it is a force uh, acting on two objects, two or more objects, two objects, okay, force acting on two objects, okay, uh, yeah, okay, I think force acting on two objects is uh, fine, or force acting between two objects, uh, it's also, it can be considered gravitational force, okay, kalau dalam bahasa Melayu, it's daya yang bertindak di antara mana-mana dua jasa dalam alam semesta, sorry, Dalam alam semesta, in the universe. <laughs> it's a very strange definition. Lah. Okay, but uh, force between two objects, okay, it's, uh, I think it is fine. Lah. Uh, you can say it's an attracting force lah, okay, between, that is acting on both objects, okay, on two objects. Uh, any two objects in the, in the universe, that's fine. Okay. Calculate the gravitational force between the Earth and the satellite. Uh, and then you're given all this formula. Lah. Okay, so the formula for gravitational force, okay, is F G M M over R squared. Uh, okay, over R squared. Uh, and of course, you have both the mass here, which is the Earth and the satellite. You have the distance between the Earth center and the satellite center. 
Okay, and then you're given a gravitational constant. So you just substitute everything into the formula, you will get 7.71 times 10 to the power of 3 newtons. Okay, I uh, ask you to do this on your own. Lah. Okay, I don't think it's that. There's nothing much to it. Lah. Just remember the formula for gravitational force. Okay, now if you, I don't think you have this, but in this paper, when I look at the formula list, okay, uh, gravitational force is given, centripetal is given, orbital period is given, escape velocity is given. Okay, of course, uh, Kepler's law is also given. Lah. Okay, but again, uh, just to remind you that not always uh, all the formulas are given. Okay, uh, we have no idea. I have no idea. Okay, usually in physics papers, the formulas will change every year one day. Not every formula is given. Lah. Okay, but what I can tell you is whatever formula that they give uh, is usually meant to help you in the paper one. Okay, means you can use the formula, but not every formula you have to use. Lah. Okay, so you know, bear that in mind. If you're stuck and you don't remember the formula, go to the front of the book. Uh, of the question paper uh, and see whether the formula that you want is there. Okay, so in this case, gravitational force is given G M1 M2, uh, you know, divide by R squared. Okay, so you calculate this and you will get 7 times 10, 7.71 times 10 to the power of 3. Okay, which pair of bodies experience the smallest gravitational force? Okay, if you think about this, so which pair is either satellite and earth, or moon and earth, or satellite and the moon. Obviously, it will be the satellite and the moon. Lah, and then you're required to give a reason. So if we look at the gravitational force, we find uh, that three, there are two things that are very important. Lah. Okay, The mass of both the objects that are pulling against one another is one. And of course, their distance. Okay, Now, in this case, we find that we don't really know what is the distance. Lah. We don't really know what's the distance between the satellite and the moon. But we know uh, that the satellite and the moon, okay, the, the mass uh, is so much smaller compared to the mass of the Earth. Okay, look at the mass of the satellite. It's only times 10 to the power of 3. The mass of the Earth uh, is 10 to the power of 24. Okay, don't even need to think about the moon. The moon will probably also have a very uh, uh, very big, sorry. Sorry, the moon also will probably have a very small mass compared to the Earth lah, because the moon is smaller than the Earth. Also, if you kind of look at it, nah, the distance between the satellite and the moon okay, seems less okay, compared to the distance between the moon and the Earth. Uh, maybe the distance between the satellite and the Earth is also less. Lah. But I think the biggest factor uh, is the mass of the two objects. Okay, so since the mass of the two objects are very small, so they will experience the smallest gravitational force. Okay, so we will say the pair of bodies that experiences the smallest gravitational force will be the moon and the satellite. Okay, why? Because the masses are small okay compared to the earth's mass okay both the masses of the moon and the the, the satellite okay will have uh you know will have very small mass lah, okay compared to the earth all right, question number three, diagram three shows the sound waves produced in the air when a gong is hit by a hammer. Okay, so we're talking about sound waves, so the type of sound wave will definitely be longitudinal. Okay, remember uh, that, sorry, longitudinal waves. Remember that sound waves uh, is the only example of longitudinal waves. If the other waves, which is transverse wave, okay, it's, uh, you know, light wave, uh, sorry, light wave, water wave, okay, yang pergi atas dan bawah lah. All those are transverse wave. Okay, sound wave is a type of longitudinal waves. So based on diagram 3, name the region in X. Okay, so uh, longitudinal waves, especially sound waves, comprise of two uh, sections lah. The one where, you know, all the molecules are kind of compressed together, okay, is called the compression region. 
and the ones where the molecules are far apart, okay, for example, this, this is called the rarefaction region. Okay, so X, since X is in the rarefaction region, so X will be rarefaction. Okay, it will be uh, rarefaction. Now, determine the wave, sorry, uh, sorry, for transverse wave, since it is up and down, right? So the up over here will be called crest, and then the down here will be called trough. Lah. Okay, just so that you know the difference between the two transverse, as crest and trough, uh, longitudinal has compression and rarefaction. Okay. Now determine the wavelength for the sound wave produced by the gong. So we find that, okay, <laughs> we find that there's these two over here. Lah. One is this 0 0.8, and the other one is this 1.2. Sound wave, uh, whether it is transverse or longitudinal, it is always the distance between two of the same things, either crest to crest or trough to trough for transverse waves, or compression to the next compression, or rarefaction to the next rarefaction. So in this case, the obvious answer will be 1.2 because it is from compression to compression. Why we cannot take 0 0.8? Because they did a habis. It is like the starting of the compression until the middle of the rarefaction. What are we what are we measuring? Okay, so it's not stated over there. Lah. Okay, so the this one is 1.2 meters. Okay, determine the wave. Lah. Now the speed of the sound of the air is 330. Calculate the frequency. So you have the wavelength, which is given as 1.2. Okay, if they give you the speed, they ask you to count frequency. Think about this, huh? You have the wavelength, you have the speed, and you have the frequency. There's only one formula that is very important when you talk about waves, which is the wave equation. V equals to F times lambda. Okay, so you substitute V and you substitute lambda, you will get about F equals to 275 hertz. Okay, the unit for F is hertz. Now, when sound wave travels through water, state what happens to the speed of wave. This is very logical. Okay, will it be faster or will it be slower? Now, remember uh, that sound waves uh, is, a tr is a longitudinal wave. So, it doesn't behave uh, in the same way as a uh, transverse wave. Okay, so in water, this is actually a trick question. In water, sound wave Okay, the speed of the sound wave actually increases. Okay, because the water waves carry the energy much faster. Okay, light waves, we know that light waves, uh, when it enters into the water, the speed of the wave, the speed of light uh, will decrease. Okay, because you know it's very hard to tumble. Slow. But sound waves uh, are special in that sense that the more molecules there are, Okay, the faster it is for sound to travel. Daripada di udara. Okay, and this is proven to us uh, very simply by, you know, I don't know whether you do this. Lah, you know, every time I give this example, lah, all the millennials will look at me one kind and, and like, Sir, what are you talking about? We have never experienced this in our life. So, when I was much younger, okay, when us Gen X, lah, when we were much younger, we used to play this telephone game. You know. So we will have this, this tin kosong and then, you know, with a sambo, satu tali, uh, with another tin kosong, then we speak to each other from far away, lah, like, hello, hello. Then the guy on the other side will be holding, wow, saya boleh dengar kau punya suara, walaupun kamu berbisik. Okay, because it works on the principle. Sound wave travels much faster in a solid compared to gas, compared to in the air. Sound waves travel much faster because the more molecules transferring the energy, you know, and in a solid, nah, it is, you know, the molecules are nearer to one another. So they will carry the sound waves even more faster. But in transverse waves, nah, especially light waves, nah, when light wave enter into water, when light wave enter into a solid, nah, it's very difficult to move. You know, partly also because of the feature of the waves nah, is transverse. So it is the the vibration is this way, but the 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 sorry the vibration is up and down, and then the propagation of the wave is going forward, you know. So there's a lot of halangan over there. So sound slide waves travels very fast 
in, in the air. But sound waves travel faster as you go into solid. Lah. So compared to air, water is faster and compared to water, solid is much faster. Okay, and again proven to us by that that <laughs> that, uh, that telephone telephone thing. Lah. Okay, so oh yeah, maybe after SPM when you're free, I'll go and play with the telephone thing. Lah. Okay, yeah, use that kind of telephone for once instead of your handphone. Okay, number four, diagram four shows a monkey has a firm hold <laughs> on a light rope that passes over a frictionless pulley and is attached to a 15 kg bunch of bananas. Okay, so um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know why the monkey is there. So the monkey and the bananas are in equilibrium. Okay, the monkey and the bananas are in equilibrium. So the question is, what is the resultant force? Lah? Okay, what is the resultant force that is acting uh, on the pulley system? And uh, if you see a line, uh, okay, I know that usually when you think of resultant force, we want to calculate, calculate, right? But when you see a line, uh, you kind of know that there is no calculation involved. Uh. Either is you see and you can find the answer, for example, like this question just now, okay, 1.2 meters, tiada, uh, tiada apa yang mau dikira. On top of that, it's only one mark. Uh. Okay, so memang kau nampak saja kamu tahu. Or, uh, you know, the yeah, either you see or you see, or there is a, some calculation, but it's so easy to do uh, that you don't even need to calculate. Lah. Okay, and obviously the answer for this will be zero newtons because the key word for this is it is in equilibrium. When the forces are in equilibrium, the resultant force is always zero newtons. Okay, so nothing to calculate over here. So indicate the direction of forces and label all the forces that are acting on the monkey. Okay, this is two marks. So indicating to you that there are two forces. Lah. Okay, obviously the first force will be downwards and this will be the weight of the monkey. Okay, the second one will be the pull of the string. Lah. Okay, this force upwards, uh, which we will usually call the tension of the string. Okay, so the two forces over there which is the tension and this one. And since it is in equilibrium, uh, in this case, the tension equals to the weight. Lah. Okay, so that's a very important thing. Tension equals to weight. So the question is, what is the weight of the monkey? Okay, now since the tension uh, is being held by the, the bananas and the bananas are 15 kg, you can safely say uh, that the mass of the but the monkey is also about 15 kg lah, since it is in equilibrium. Okay, that means the weight of the bananas is also the same as the weight of the monkey since it is in equilibrium. Lah. So it will be 15 times 9.81. Okay, weight equals to mass times gravity. Okay, so 15 times 9.81 will get about 147.15 newtons. Okay, a bit kurang lah. Now, another monkey of mass 12 kg saw the bananas and jumped towards the bananas and hold the end of rope X, which is here. So, you have another monkey over here, sorry, holding on to the rope. <laughs> okay, so the question is what happens to the motion of both monkeys? Okay, so this is very logical. Uh, there's really nothing to this. What do you think will happen to both the monkeys? Both the monkeys will obviously go downwards, right? Okay, so both monkeys will move downwards. Okay, why? Because the weight of the monkeys has increased, but the weight of the banana is still the same. Okay, it's still 147.15 newtons. Okay, so you want to be careful with this. Lah. Okay, calculate the acceleration of the system and the tension of the rope. Okay, and uh, this one we will have to assume uh, uh, that, <laughs> sorry, this one we will have to assume that uh, it is including the monkey. There's a weakness in this question uh, because when I look at this question first, I'm like, oh, okay, do I, does this, I, do I have to calculate the tension of the rope or the acceleration of the system? Uh, when it is, you know, with just one monkey or both monkeys, okay. But after I think, think, think about it, it cannot be just one monkey because it's in equilibrium. Can cannot be four marks uh, for the answer zero acceleration and then the tension also is zero. 
uh, tension is also uh, 147.1 plus so cannot be lah. Okay, so we will have to form the equations. Okay, so the first equation, sorry. Okay, the first equation will be with the two monkeys. Okay, you, <laughs> yeah, the first equation with the two monkeys. So the two monkeys, uh, this is 15 kg and this is 27 kg lah. Okay, ah, sorry, 12 kg. So all together will be 27 kg, right? So 27 kg times 9.81 uh, will give you, oh no, what's my calculator? Twenty-seven times nine point eight one will give you two six four point eight seven. Okay, two six four point eight seven minus the tension. Okay, is equals to. Remember, resultant force equals to m a. Okay, f equals to m a. So the weight of the monkeys minus the tension of the string will equal to the mass of the monkeys times the acceleration. Okay, so the mass of the monkeys is 27A. So this is our first equation. 264.87 minus T equals to uh, 27A. Okay, the weight of the monkeys, weight, no, not the mass, the weight of the monkeys minus the tension. Because the thing is going down, no? okay, so the weight has to be firstly counted, no? equals to the mass of the monkeys, both together, 27 times A, which is the this one. Because the question is asking us to find the acceleration and the tension of the rope. Okay, and usually in calculation questions that involve pulley, uh, you want to have uh, you know, you want to have two equations, uh, usually uh, then you find the T and then you find the A and you just put in the answer in there. Uh. But we need a second equation for this. Okay, the second equation for this obviously will involve the bananas. Okay, so the bananas are going to go upwards. So the MA, the A is going to be upwards this way. Lah. But also, at the same time, the bananas have this force and tension between them. You have the weight of the bananas, okay, minus the tension of the string. Okay, but since the acceleration is going in the same direction as the tension, this equation will be T minus W. Okay, equals to MA. Because the bananas are going upwards in the direction of the tension, the acceleration follows the direction of tension, so we put the tension first. In the case of the red color, the acceleration is following the direction of the weight of the monkeys. So we put the weight of the monkeys first, minus the tension. Okay, so T minus W equals to MA. You can count the W from here. Lah. T minus 15 times uh, 9.81 is 147.15. Okay, equals to the mass is 15A. So this is our second equation. Okay, T minus 147.15 equals to 15A. So you solve these simultaneous equations. Okay, and you should get the answer. Lah. Okay, the answer will be A equals to 2.803 meters per second squared. Okay, and the T is equals to 189.195. 195 newtons. Okay, solve the, uh, the equation lah. Okay, using simultaneous equations. So for pulley systems, uh, especially when it involves calculation, lah, okay, biasanya akan melibatkan pengiraannya macam ni, yang ada two equations. Especially if the pulley is, both sides are moving, uh, one is going down, one is going up. Okay, so it will be good for you to practice this. Lah. Okay. Alright, question number five. Diagram 5.1, 5.2 show fringes form when identical monochromatic lines pass through the double slits. Okay. So this is obvious, sorry, this is uh, a wave phenomena, which is interference. Okay, so we need to have that in mind as we answer this question, because you know that when you talk about interference, uh, there's going to be the lambda equals to AX over D. Okay, just to remind you, A is given here, X is here, which is from one fringe to another fringe, and this is our D. Okay, don't memorize what the this one means, visualize it. Okay, this is A, this is X, this is D. 
Okay, so that you remember. Now, what is the meaning of monochromatic light? Okay, so monochromatic uh, comes from the words mono, which means one, chromatic, which means color. Okay, so you can say that monochromatic light is light that has only one color. Okay, light with one color only. Okay, but in terms of physics, uh, when we talk about monochromatic light, uh, usually we like to use the words wavelength. Okay, so I would go, uh, personally, uh, I would answer monochromatic light is light with one wavelength only. Okay, for example, all the seven colors of the rainbow are all monochromatic. Red is a different wavelength. Yellow is a different wavelength. Green is a different wavelength. Blue is a different wavelength. White. White is not a monochromatic color because white is actually a combination of all the seven colors of the rainbow. Okay, and here's, I think I did this last year with you all and I'm going to remind you again now. There is actually no such color as black. <laughs> okay, black or no wavelength one. Okay, black is just the absence of light. There is no light. That's why it's black. So when we say black color, actually it is no light color, no wavelength. So what we are seeing is just no light. That's why it's black. Okay. <laughs> if you have time now, okay, maybe after SPM, you should watch. Uh, this this documentary teaches us uh, uh, how why is it that we see certain things as color you know and when you think about it uh, it's actually wow actually uh, it's not because that thing is this color it's that thing uh, can absorb every color except for this color that's why the one that they are rejecting is the one that we are seeing okay anyway that's a very long story which i don't want to waste time with uh, but light is pretty interesting uh. Okay, so there's no such thing as black color. Black color is just the absence of light, no light. Okay. I think I mentioned to you all also, right? That there's no such thing as coal. Right? It's coal is just no heat. You can't create coal, but you can create heat. Or you can, you know, you can change energy to heat. But you can't change energy to become coal. You just take the heat away. Okay, anyway, now compare <laughs> compare the distance between the slits A. Uh I think I'm not going to waste time. Lah. Okay, obviously 5.2 is bigger than 5.1. You can see this from here. Okay, the distance. Uh, the wavelength of the light that passes through the double slits. Uh, is it given? Is it given? Is it given? Oh, it's not given. Oh, it's not given. Okay. Sorry, the wavelength is the same because it's identical monochromatic lights. Okay, so... Monochromatic is one wavelength plus. So since it's identical, the wavelength will be the same. Okay, so compare the distance between the double slits and the screen, which is the D la. Okay, so also same. Compare the distance between the double slits and the screen. It's also the same. Then lastly, compare the distance between the fringes X. Okay, when you look at this, obviously 5.1 is bigger than 5.2. Okay, so use your answers in 5b. State the relationship between x and a. This is x and this is a. Okay, we find that when a is bigger, the x is smaller. Okay, and not the other way around. Huh? So a yang menentukan x, bukan x yang menentukan a. So be very careful with this. Lah. So when a increases, sorry, the bigger the a, Okay, the smaller the x. Okay. All right. Based on diagram 5.1, the slit separation is 0 0.2 millimeters. Slit separation is A. The wavelength is 450 nanometers. Calculate the distance Y. Okay. We are looking at diagram 5.1 now. So diagram 5.1, the D is 6 meters. Okay, D is 6 meters. Now, coming back to the formula again, it is lambda equals to AX over D. But, look at the units. One is meter, one is nanometer, one is millimeter. So, this one you will have to change this. Lah. Okay, the wavelength is 450 nanometers. So, 
450 times 10 to the power negative 9 equals to 0 0.2 milli is times 10 to the power of negative 3. Okay, times 10 to the power of negative 3. Okay, times x over d is 6 meters. Okay, so when you calculate, calculate this, you will get x equals to 0 0.0135 meters. Okay, about lah. 0.0135 meters. But the question uh, is not asking for x down. The question is calculate the total distance y. The total distance y means we need to see how many sets of x are there. Okay, there are per set lah. Okay, x and other designer. So let me see. Uh. Okay, so this is one set. This is two sets. This is three sets. This is four sets. Okay, so if every x is 0 0.0135 meters, sorry, x equals to 0 0.0135 meters, so y, there are four sets of x, right? So y is equals to 4 times 0 0.0135, which will give you uh, 0 0.0544 4 meters. Okay, then yang so walk to the manual. So we find interference, huh? kita tidak boleh lari daripada formula inilah. Okay, when we find interference, whether it's this interference of sound or interference of light, we cannot run away from this lambda equals to AX over D. Memang akan ada. And we have previously seen in another paper that usually interference formula, sorry, interference, interference, interference calculation, huh? The units will be different one. One will be millimeter, one will be nanometer, and one will be meter. So make sure you change everything to meter. Okay, that's the important thing. Okay, question number six. Number six, again, we're expecting a compare and relate. Okay, kind of question. Huh? Show two circuits used to investigate the relationship between potential difference and the electric current of the constant wire of different length. Wow, doesn't this look familiar? <laughs> Diagram 6.1b and 6.2b. Oh my goodness. Show the graph of potential difference okay, against electric current. The gradient of the graph represents the resistance of the constant wire. Okay, so take a look at this. Alright, what is the meaning of potential difference? Potential difference is uh, the uh, energy, uh, okay, the amount of energy of electrical energy lah. okay needed to move uh, yeah to move one coulomb of charge uh, between two points okay between two points are uh, in a circuit Okay, so the electrical energy is a little bit <laughs> Yeah, work done also can. Among electrical energy, work done to move. Uh, yeah, yeah, can. You can use work done. Work done to move uh, one coulomb of charge between two points in the circuit. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, the reason why I say amount of electrical energy uh, is because um, when you say work done, uh, okay, um, when we talk about work, uh, we always talk about in terms of, you know, like in joules. Uh, when we talk about electrical energy, we're talking about the unit of EV, uh, okay, uh, electron volts, uh, which is electrical energy, uh, okay, which is how we use to determine uh, potential difference. I'm not saying that work done is wrong. Uh, textbook definition is work done. Work done, you know, to move one coulomb of charge between two points in the circuit. But I like this. Well, of course, lah. I like my definition better because it specifically says electrical energy. Okay. Of course, <laughs> in this case only, I can say electrical energy, lah. Okay. Uh, at high level physics, we talk about potential difference. Let's say waterfall, lah. Waterfall, there's actually a potential difference as well. That's where we get the potential energy from. Uh, there you can say work done. Uh. Okay, anyway, 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 anyway. Yeah, like, either way, you can say work done. Uh. Okay, I just prefer the same amount of electric energy. Okay, compare the length. Uh. You can see over here that obviously 6.1 is bigger than 6.2. Okay. 
sorry, 6.1a is bigger than 6.2a, a, right? Yeah. Okay, secondly, compare the resistance of the constant wire. Okay, this one you need to know. Lah. Okay, resistance increases with the length. Okay, so the same thing, 6.1a increases with, uh, sorry, it's bigger than 6.2a. Okay, relate the length of the wire and the resistance. Okay, how do you know this? Uh, it's also, you look at the gradient. This one, the gradient is higher. This one, the gradient is lower. Okay, gradient is kecerunan. So, makin dia curam, makin tinggi lah dia punya gradient. Kan? Makin dia mendatar, makin rendah. Okay, dia punya uh, gradient. So, 6.1B, sorry, my mistake. 6.1B has a bigger resistance than 6.2B. So, relate the length of the wire and the resistance. So, the long, the bigger the length, Okay, the resistance also will be bigger. Okay, not the other way around. I'll remember that. Okay, diagram 6.3 shows two resistors X and Y, resistance of 20 ohms, respectively connected to dry cell 6 volts. Okay, so each of these has 20 uh, ohms and this is also 20 ohms. Just a reminder, I spoke about this to the 5ST this morning. This is a symbol for four batteries huh? because it's six volts. Lah. Okay, but the reason why we do this dot 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 is so that we don't have to one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> okay, it's so long, lah, you know. So usually a lot of diagrams they will shortcut it. Lah. Okay, you just draw the first and the last battery and then you dot 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 dot, dot across. And then you write down there six volts. So you pandai pandai kira on your own. Lah. One battery is about 1.5 volts. So six volts still four batteries. Lah. This is obviously, this is obviously much easier to draw than this one, because it's one two one two. <laughs> okay, so you don't want to do that. Okay, so based on the diagram six point three, calculate the effective resistance. This is a uh, parallel circuit, so parallel circuit is one over. Okay, so one over R equals to one over twenty plus one over twenty. Uh, you will get R equals to 2, 10 ohms. Okay, you will get R equals to 10 ohms. Huh? Remember everybody, parallel uh, connection, you need to flip the R at the end. Huh? The 1 over R kan, lepas kau dapat jawapan, pasti terbalikkan. Okay, so you get 10 ohms. After that, you can calculate the current because we already know the, car the voltage is 6 volts, the resistance is 10 ohms, so you use ohms law. Okay, to calculate the value of I, which will give you I equals to 0 0.6 uh, amps. Okay, and then the power dissipated at resistor X. Okay, now I spoke about this this morning. When we talk about power, we talk about electrical energy punya circuit lah. Okay, there are so many formulas for power. There's P equals to VI, which is a standard one. Okay, PVI. And then there's P equals to V squared over R. If you cannot, if they're not given the I, then you can calculate this one. Lah. And there's a third one, which is P equals to I squared R. But this one is a very specific power formula. This is only to calculate power loss. Or in this case, the power dissipated. Okay, kehilangan kuasa. You cannot use the other two formulas to calculate power loss. You can use the other two formulas to calculate power, okay, normally. And then on top of that, there is another formula, which is the PET formula, lah, P equals to E over T. Okay, P equals to E over T, which is energy over time, but the time must be in seconds. So there are many, many power formulas, okay, and so it's just good for us to take note, lah, okay, on the different, different power formulas uh, there are. Okay, so that you don't like get confused or anything. Like. Alright, so anyway, coming back to this. So you use P equals to I squared R. You got the I from question number two and you got the R. Uh, but you're not supposed to use the... You're not supposed to use the total one. You just want the resistor X only. 0 0.6 is the total current. But since these two uh, resistors are the same, uh, Okay, the total current will be divided equally into two. Lah. So if here is 0 0.6, come over here and here, this will be 0 0.3 and this also will be 0 0.3. Okay, so the power loss is just 0 0.3 squared times 20, which will give you 1.8 watts. 
Okay. Yeah, because I was wondering why I was using 0 0.6. Yeah. 0 0.6 is the total current okay, for the entire the circuit. Lah. But since it's asking specifically for resistor X, we need to know how much current is flowing in resistor X. Okay, and we find that it's 0 0.3. Since it is the same resistor, the current will be divided equally into two. So 0 0.3 squared times 20, you get 1.8 watts. Okay, the formula to count the power dissipation. So what will happen to the current if the resistor X is removed? Okay, will the current uh, increase or decrease? Of course, the current will decrease. Lah. Okay, why will the current decrease? Lah? Because the resistance, the total resistance has already increased. When you, bila kamu sambung, when you connect resistors in series, lah, okay, the more you add in, the bigger the resistance becomes. But when you connect resistors in parallel, okay, not in series, in parallel it is, the more resistors you add in, huh, the smaller the resistance becomes. Okay, so that's a very fundamental difference huh, between series and parallel circuit. Okay, it's makin kamu tambah perintangkan dalam parallel circuit, makin bertambah lah dia punya current. Because, sorry, because dia punya resistance, dia punya total resistance kan, akan makin berkurang. Okay, that's the magic lah, okay, of parallel uh, circuits. Okay, so this is actually a trick question lah, because people think, oh, resistor remove ah, means the current will increase lah, cause less one resistor. But no, oh, that only works for series circuit. Okay, for parallel circuit, you cannot talk anything. Parallel is the more you add in, uh, the smaller the resistance becomes. So the bigger current will flow. So you remove the resistor, the current will decrease lah, hmm, because bertambah sudah dia punya. Okay, question number seven. Number seven, we are expecting a making choice question. Kan, the section B kind of question lah. Okay, which is what you can see here. Okay, we are expecting ah. I'm not saying that it it is true, but we think that it is true lah. Okay, a lot of states seem to be doing this pattern, so I guess it is lah. Okay, seven point one a and seven point two b. What? Okay. Show two actions on the landing activity. The athlete A is wah, and then the athlete B is leg straight. Lah. So both athletes jump from the same height and fall on the same ground. Name the force that causes the athlete to fall down. Okay, the force that causes the athlete to fall down is obviously gravity lah. Okay, or gravitational force. Okay, jangan juga kamu impulsive force lah. causing to fall down. Okay, menyebabkan dia jatuh. <laughs> Okay, just ke bawah. Okay, is gravitational force. Now, both the athletes of mass 50 kg jump and landed with velocity of 4 meters per second before touching the ground. Now, the time taken is 0 0.5 and 0 0.2. So, we can calculate the impulsive force. Impulsive force is mv minus mu over t. Okay, I'm just going to do A. You can do B yourself. Lah. So, the mass is 50. Yeah? 50 times 4. Minus 50 times 0. Okay. Why 50 times 0? Uh? Because they jump from the same height. Okay. So, mereka melompat. So, the starting velocity 0. Makin dia turun ke bawah itu, makin laju lah. Okay. And kita diberitahu, the speed when just before they land uh, is V, is 4 meters per second. Over 0 0.5 is athlete A. Okay. 0 0.5. Uh, is athlete A, so you get about 400 newtons. Okay, you do the same thing for athlete B, but the time is different, right? Time for athlete B is 0 0.2 seconds. You will get 10,000 newtons. Okay, you should get about 10,000 newtons. So the question is, what is the effect of time of impact towards the impulsive force? Okay, in a sense, uh, this question is asking you the relationship as well. Uh. Okay, the bigger the time of impact, okay, bigger time of impact is 0 0.5 seconds, right? The impulsive force is smaller. Okay, the smaller the impulsive force. Okay, you can write things like this, huh? uh, like the hypothesis, the relationship question as an effect. Okay, no problem at all. Okay. 7.3 shows a set of playing equipment to be placed in the children's playground. Okay, yada yada. Shows three types of the ground. 
and the height of the glider used for the this one. Okay, so we have over here. So the material for the ground is either rubber or wood or plastic. <laughs> wow. Okay, so choose the suitable aspects to, I'm sure it is for safety lah. We want playground. Playground is played by children. So the material of the ground definitely has to be rubber lah. It's not fikir lah. Okay, why rubber? Um, because think back to this subtopic. Uh, this question is what subtopic? Impulsive force. Okay, to decrease the impulsive force. Okay, because we're talking about, let's say, kalau diram buayan buayan makan, lepas diram habis buayan maybe they want to somersault lah and then land on their feet. <laughs> Wonder which kid will do that lah. Or let's say they slide down the slide lah, and they want to land somewhere. So you want them to have a soft landing. You obviously don't want to use wood lah, kan? Okay, and plastic is so is actually quite keras. Not as keras as wood, but still quite keras lah. So small impulsive force is a good answer. But if you really really cannot remember, okay. I'm, I think, la, okay, you can also say it's safer. La. Okay, safer is, I wouldn't say that safer is, a, uh, is, a, is an acceptable answer. It may or may not be accepted. La. But, you know, there are some people who will be like, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. So, you know, just put something that makes sense or logical. Okay, one other thing I need to mention, la, when you talk about low impulsive force, Okay, you can also put another possible reason, which is to increase the time of impact. Okay, kita dapati bahawa kedua-dua ini kan biasanya dia datang sebagai satu set. Okay, small impulsive force means big time of impact. Or, or the other way around lah. Okay, now the height of the glider. Do we want a high height or do we want a low height? Okay, so for safety, la, I know if the glider is very high, then it's very, very shock. La, okay, but think about this, uh, guys. Logically, yeah, we have only one choice left. Definitely, this answer will be P. Right? Because P is the only one with rubber. So, you know, don't go and cari pasal and say that you want a high height. When you obviously know that you want this answer already. Okay, so we want a lower height. Okay, or you want a smaller height. Lah. Okay, so you want to say to decrease the velocity. Okay, or to decrease the momentum. Okay, so less momentum means, uh, you know, you have less, uh, bigger time of impact or, you know, you can, yeah, less momentum, lah, they won't go so fast. Lah. Okay, or you can also say it's safer. Lah. Okay, I'm, okay. It's not really a good idea for me to share this answer safer with you. Lah. But you know, sometimes in the exam, people can forget things. Lah. Okay, so just in case you forget things like velocity, momentum, you know, things can happen, can go with the logical answer. You obviously want a smaller height because it's safer for the children. And after that, you pray very hard that this answer can be accepted by the examiner. Lah. Okay, I suspect that different year they will have different. Uh, lain tahun kan dia orang akan ada lain uh, kelonggaran lah. Maybe one year they will accept safer. Then another year they say cannot. We cannot accept safer. It's terlalu longgar sudah kalau kita pakai safer. Okay, so it just depends on your luck lah. Okay, so obviously the answer is P. Yeah. All right. Diagram eight point one shows a copper rod placed on two electrical plates in between two bar magnets. Okay. So this one is the left hand Fleming rule. The one where it is supposed to move, not induced current. Uh, induced current is right hand Fleming rule. So left hand Fleming rule is you want to see whether the copper rod uh, move to the left or move to the right. Lah. Okay, so this is the one with the catapult force. Okay, if you remember, this is the one that talks about the catapult force. Uh. So switch is on, mark and label the direction of the current. Current flows from positive to negative. Okay, so the long stick over here is positive. So current flow, okay, you mark it as I. Okay, but question is flows through the copper rod. Nah. So if you follow this, okay, it's going to flow this way. Okay, so you write I over here. Okay, this way. Okay, the magnetic field. 
magnetic field is from north to south. So this way is the magnetic field. And we're going to give it M. Okay. So finally, the direction of the force produced. Is it going to go to the left or to the right? This one, you will have to use left-hand rule. Okay, Fleming's left-hand rule to determine this. Okay, so when you do this, sorry, the current is going inside. Okay, going inside. North to south is over here. So you're going to find that the object is going to move to the right. Okay, so the force is this way. Okay, the object is going to move to the right. So explain how the force is produced. Okay, so this one is two miles high. And definitely you have to explain. So when current flows through the copper rod, okay, the, sorry, is it a copper rod? Yeah, the copper rod, right? Okay. The rod becomes an electromagnet. Okay, with its own magnetic field. Okay, so the interaction between, sorry, first point, second point. Now, the interaction between the magnetic fields, okay, the magnetic field of the permanent, permanent magnet and electromagnet. Produces okay, a force. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you something a little bit extra. Lah. Although it's two marks and this is actually enough already, you should also actually mention lah, the direction. The direction of the force is determined by using Fleming's left hand rule. Okay. I would give this answer. This, I mean, the stand, this is a standard answer. Like current flows, it becomes electromagnetic, then the interaction between this one produces a force. Okay. Then the direction of force is determined by Fleming's left hand rule. Actually, there's another one, lah, okay, which talks about the like catapult force, but good enough for this question. Lah. Okay. Sorry uh, if I'm going very fast, uh, you have to catch up later, lah, okay? Because I want to finish this entire paper today. So I'm going as fast as I can. If you missed something or you didn't copy anything, wait for the video to come out and then press pause so that you can copy the answer. Lah. Okay. Sorry, uh, hold on. Okay. Uh, diagram 8.2 shows a simple electrical motor. Okay, diagram 8.2 shows a simple electrical motor. Okay, so suggest the modification that can be done to the electrical motor to enable it to uh, function effectively. Okay, so the thickness of the coil. Uh, this one, if you want the motor to function effectively, you need the current to flow better. Lah. Okay. Uh, and we did discuss, I did discuss some of it this morning with uh, 5SD for the, the seven people that were there today. <laughs> I wonder how many people are going to school tomorrow for SD. Do I even need to go to school to see you all? Uh, okay, please tell me uh, if I need to go. If I don't need to go, then I won't go. Okay, because it's so far away from my school. Wow. <laughs> okay, the thickness of the coil should be uh, smaller. Lah. Okay, so smaller thickness. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Shouldn't be smaller, it should be a bigger thickness. Uh, yeah, it should be a bigger thickness. Increase the thickness. Okay, yeah, it should be increase the thickness. Huh? Why do we increase the thickness of the coil? Is to uh, reduce the resistance. Because when resistance is reduced, current is increased. Okay, when the resistance decreases, current increases, so if current increase means better, you know, better motor spin because more current can flow. La. So we want that. Okay. All right. Next one. 
uh, shape of the magnet. Okay, so the shape of the magnet. Uh, in this case, our magnet here is you know flat like that. Okay, so we want a radial shape lah. Okay, radial magnet. Yang berbentuk macam ni. Okay, so it is a little bit curved lah. We don't say circle magnet. Uh, we say radial magnet lah. Okay, so to produce a radial magnetic field. Okay, to produce a radial magnetic field. So radial magnetic field uh, is a little bit more focused. Lah. Okay, so rather than straight, 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 macam ni kan, and then yang di atas ini akan kehilangan, but kalau dia straight kan, okay, the ones on top here will be useless. But radial is kind of, you know, everything on top, so it will still be inside here. Lah. Okay, so it's one big circle. Uh, and it, you know it produces a better magnetic field uh, for uh, you know for electromagnetic purposes lah. okay sorry uh, just a little short note on this so instead of saying a radial magnet you can also say curved magnet lah. okay uh, really doesn't matter but there are even some versions which should say c shaped magnet <laughs> Okay, also can be mentioned. Okay, but we call this a radial magnet because it produces a radial, uh, radial uh, magnetic field. Uh. Okay, uh, but we cannot say C-shaped magnetic field. Uh. Definitely cannot. Uh. Okay, the shape of the magnet is C-shaped. Uh. Definitely can. Uh, but we cannot say C-shaped magnetic field. Magnetic field may not radial. Okay, so we can use curved magnet, radial magnet, C-shaped magnet. I don't want to so can. Uh. Okay, uh, not really a problem. <laughs> No, there's no ring-shaped magnet because a ring-shaped magnet is like this. You can have one magnet ring and then the other magnet is a ring. Where is the magnetic field going to go to? Okay, it's going to go all over the place. No, 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 cannot, cannot. Okay, they need to go from one to another. Well, how do you do the north and the south? Yeah, can, yeah. anyway. Okay, let's go to this question. Huh? 9.1 shows a stainless steel straw in a glass of an ice string. The stainless steel straw achieve thermal equilibrium. Now, logically, you know that the straw is going to decrease in temperature. Okay, it's going to decrease in temperature. So, obviously, this is what is the meaning of thermal equilibrium? Huh? Now, I'm only going to give you the keywords. Huh? Okay, thermal contact. Sorry. Uh, and uh, net. Sorry, what, what is the word that we always use? The net heat flow. Huh? Right. Net heat transfer. Our net heat transfer. Okay, is zero. Okay, I'm just gonna give you these two keywords. Okay, so however you pushing pushing lah. Okay, make sure those keywords are inside. Two objects in thermal contact. Maybe heat transfer. Heat transfer. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, based on the concept of thermal equilibrium, explain how the stainless steel straw becomes as cold as the ice string in the glass. Now, this is. Basically, uh, it is like the definition of thermal equilibrium. Okay, the same keywords have to be in, except that you have to make it a four point this one. Lah. Okay, so uh, I will give you a summary of this. Uh. Number one, the straw and ice are in thermal contact. Okay, that's the first point that must be mentioned. Okay, so there is heat transfer. Heat transfer <laughs> between the straw and ice. Okay, heat transfer between straw and ice. I think I have already talked about this explanation before. I've given it to you, uh, most likely in the Pahang or Trangano paper. I can't remember one of those papers. Lah. Okay, heat transfer between the straw and ice, and then after that, the heat transfer continue until. Uh, Sorry, thermal equilibrium is achieved when net heat transfer is zero. Okay, and then the final point is both the straw and ice achieve the same temperature. Okay, sorry, uh, achieve. I E V E. Yeah. Okay, so that's how we get the four points. So, 
if you think about it, it is almost the same uh, as the definition for thermal equilibrium. Cuma kamu kena panjangkannya jadi empat markah. Okay, so talk about the thermal contact. What are the two objects in thermal contact? And then after that, because they're in thermal contact, there will be heat transfer. Okay, the heat transfer continues until you reach thermal equilibrium where the net heat transfer is zero. And then they find that they and when thermal equilibrium happens, they also reach the same temperature. Okay. Right. Now diagram 9.2 shows a food bag used by the student to bring his food to the school. He noticed that the food becomes cold during the recess time. Wow. <laughs> okay. So for specification of lunch bags, PQRS. So we want to do this. Lah. Okay, so plastic. Sorry, the material of the food bag, I assume is the outside one. Lah. Okay, we want plastic or cloth. Okay, obviously we want plastic. Okay, because plastic is a good heat insulator. Ah. Jangan juga kamu cakap conductor. Okay, it is a good heat insulator. So, you know, heat very difficult to, you know, terlepas daripadanya. Another possible answer also is... Uh, Speci high, high specific heat capacity. Okay, so it won't get hot faster. So that means the heat uh, can still be maintained uh, inside. Okay, now the inner layer of the food bag. If you know this food bag, uh, you know already actually this answer. Definitely it has to be a shiny surface. Lah. Why would we want a dull surface inside? Because this is to keep food bags. Okay, I use these kind of bags actually when I go shopping uh, and then I buy all this frozen food like fish or frozen chicken. Uh, I put it in those bags because, you know, it will last a bit longer. Lah, okay, or it will, you know, be cooler longer. So why do we want a shiny surface? Okay, shiny surface usually is uh, to do with, it's a good reflector. Okay, so it will keep the cold air inside or keep the hot food hot okay the makanan yang panas akan kekal panas lah because it's shiny so the heat will just keep you know reflecting inside if it is dull lah dia akan menyerap the haba so bila dia menyerap haba daripada makanan itulah yang makanan tu jadi sejuk because haba itu dikeluarkan daripada makanan but if it is a reflective surface it will reflect the heat and the light back to the food okay to keep the food hot Okay, the specific heat capacity of the food bag, obviously, it has to be high. Lah. Okay, so we want high, so we're thinking about this one or possibly this one. Okay, the two highest ones. Okay, why do we want a high specific heat capacity? Uh, is you know, usually we say uh, high specific heat capacity gets hot, gets hot slower. Okay, it takes a longer time to become hotter. Lah. Okay, or, or another one uh, over here will be to uh, decrease heat loss. Okay, because we are talking about the entire food bag itself. Okay, so you know, if it takes a very long time to, to you know, mengasi, menjadi panas, lah, so it, you know, the heat loss is uh, minimal. Okay, it takes a very long time to absorb the heat. Now, density of the food bag is really a no-brainer. If you've answered enough of these questions, uh, you know that you definitely want the food bag to be low density. Why low density? The answer is almost always lighter. Yalah, siapa yang mau pegang itu food bag yang berat, maka nampak humban di kepala orang. You want lighter. Lighter so that it's easier to carry. So that the food can be heavy. Lah. If the food also heavy, then the bag also heavy. Bagus saya ke bawa bag sekolah kalau begitu. Okay, so the obvious choice is P lah. Okay, P because of second, 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 then second. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, 9.3 shows a non-calibrated thermometer. The thermometer has a mercury column of length 4 cm at a temperature of 0, 22 at 100. Then the 17.5 cm when immersed at liquid P. Okay, so give one reason mercury is used as a liquid uh, in a thermometer. Now, the best reason, okay, the best reason, and I always say this, lah, okay, it always expands 
and contracts uniformly. Okay, this is my favorite reason. There are many reasons. Okay, there are many reasons. Okay, it doesn't stick to glass. It has a very high boiling point. You know, but my favorite one is it expands and contracts uniformly. Okay, the reason why we use mercury in a thermometer. Okay, so how do you determine the temperature of the liquid P in Kelvin? You have to determine it first uh, in uh, in degrees Celsius, lah, and then you change it to Kelvin. Now, the formula, I don't think is given, okay? Uh, and I don't want to turn back to the first page just to look at it. Lah. But the formula is, a particular temperature at a certain length is equals to the length at that temperature minus the length at 0 degrees Celsius over the length at 100 degrees Celsius minus the length at 0 degrees Celsius times... Uh, times 100. Okay, this is, a, this is what we call uh, the calibration formula. The thermometer calibration formula. Okay, now there are a lot of L's, L's, L's over here, but can't. just remember, okay, the length, the temperature that you want to find, okay, the length at the temperature, which is this one, this is L O. Ah, sorry, L theta. Okay, 17.5 centimeters when it is immersed when it is at a certain temperature it becomes 17.5 and then if you see this one uh, 4 cm when the temperature is 0 degrees celsius so this is l0 okay 22 cm at 100 degrees celsius so this is l100 okay so when you do this you get 17.5 minus uh, 4.0 over uh, 22.5 minus 4 times 100. Is it 22.5? Sorry, 22.0. 22.0 minus 4 times uh, 100. So you get the answer 75 degrees Celsius, but you need to change it to Kelvin. So you just plus with 273, you should get the answer 348 Kelvin. Now, this formula is a very important formula. Lah. Okay, which I don't know whether they post it in the beginning of the paper. Um, I don't think so. Lah. It's a very uncommonly shared uh, uh, formula. Okay, but if you notice, uh, this is a four mark question. Okay, and look at the working. The working is very simple. The problem usually will arise uh, because you don't remember the calibration formula. Okay. Uh, it, if you are targeting heat, lah, okay, which you know we don't know whether it's going to come out. If heat is coming out, and if it comes out in section B, you know that it's going to be a calculation question. Okay. And if it is thermometer, it will be this formula. Okay, so you might want to like kind of memorize this formula. I would advise you to. Lah. Okay, question number 10, Archimedes principle. Uh, I feel that I have answered this question already, right? Did I already answer this question? I think I answered this with 5ST. I don't know whether I answered this with 5SA. If I don't use the formula, tapi jawaban betul pun boleh. Sorry, uh, this one, uh, somebody asked me if you don't use the formula but you get the right answer. Actually, any other way is accepted. There is more than one way to answer this question, actually. Kau pakai nisbah-nisbah pun boleh tu sebenarnya. Okay, you can still get the same answer. No problem. So, uh, Archimedes principle, I remember discussing Archimedes principle with your class, but am I? So, Archimedes principle, uh, so we find that, uh, you know, in three different situations, the first one, the metal bar is in the air, 20 newtons. Put inside the water, but you notice how it's put inside the water, uh, only uh, some of it is inside the water. Okay, only this part is inside the water. Okay, you get 14 newtons. And when you immerse the whole thing, you get 10 newtons. Okay, so the question is, what is pushing this guy up until they berkurang? Okay, obviously it's the buoyant force. Lah. Okay, and you notice here that this buoyant force is how much? It's 6 newtons because it has to balance out these 20 newtons. Okay, so the pushing up is 6 newtons, that's why 14 plus 6, you get 20. So if this one now, the weight is 10 newtons, so the buoyant force must be 10 newtons long to get the balance of the 20 newtons. 
Okay. And we find uh, that how much of it uh, is inside the water is actually the thing that determines the buoyant force. Okay, let me repeat this. Uh. No matter what is your size of the object, uh, okay, whether it is a big cup like this uh, or uh, you know, just a flat piece like this, right? How much of it is in the water is the factor that determines the buoyant force. Okay, so you can, so if let's say this calculator is very, very, very light, okay, and this, this one is very, very heavy, okay, the mark is very heavy, la. okay, the buoyant force uh, for both cases will be different, obviously, but it is always determined uh, by how much of the calculator is inside the water, the volume of the object that is inside the water is the one that determines the buoyant force. Okay, there's one thing that you need to remember when we talk about buoyant force. So it's not always about what is heavy, whether it is heavier or lighter. Okay, it's always about how much water it can push aside okay, to generate the buoyant force. So diagram 10.1a shows a metal block measured by spring balance. Okay, everything is there. Uh, density of the water is 1 times 10 to the power of 3 uh, kilograms per meter cube. Okay. What is Archimedes' principle? Okay, Archimedes' principle is buoyant force equals to the weight. Sorry. Buoyant force okay, is equal to the weight of water displaced. Ultimately, uh, a very, very, very important, uh, uh, a very, very important uh, discovery by Archimedes. Uh, how much water you can push aside, the weight of the water you can push aside, is determined by three things. Buoyant force is equals to rho v g. Okay, it depends on the density of the this one. The volume of the object, not the volume of the water. Okay, the density of the liquid, the volume of the object inside the liquid, and the gravity. Okay, are the three factors that affect the buoyant force. So you want a big buoyant force, huh? you need to have a big density liquid, you need to have a big volume, okay, that is inside the liquid, huh? not floating on top. Okay. Very important. How much of it is inside the liquid is what matters. Floating on top doesn't matter. Okay, and of course the gravity lah. on Earth, gravity is 9.81, so it doesn't really make much of a difference. Okay, what is the buoyant force acting on the metal in 10B? We already calculated that 10B is 6 newtons. Okay, so calculate the volume of the metal block in diagram 10. The density of the water is uh, 1 times 10 to the power of 3. I'm going to assume that this is what we're talking about. Lah. Okay, so the buoyant force is 10 newtons. F equals to rho Vg, theta mal theta V. Okay, so rho is 1 times 10 to the power of 3. V, we want to count, G is 9.81. Okay, and you will get the answer 1.02 times 10 to the power of negative 3 meter per, uh, meter cube, sorry. Okay, 1.02 times 10 to the power of negative 3. Okay, we cannot, okay, why is it that we cannot use this one? Huh? Okay, we can, but the question is not asking, huh? calculate how much of it is inside the water. And it's asking us to calculate the entire volume. Okay, so we have to consider the situation where the buoyant force is maximum now. Okay, everything is inside the water. Okay. Now, diagrams 10B and 10C show that the volume of displaced water increases when the metal block is lowered into the water. Okay, take a look at this. Uh, the volume of displaced water. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the volume of water, the more you push inside, okay, the more water will come out. Lah. Okay, the more water will come out, as shown in 10B and 10C. The question is, what would happen to the displaced water if the block is lowered further into the water? You push the block in some more. Okay. Now, this one, uh, if we go by our logic, uh, 
whenever you go to the bathroom, then you put your hand inside the inside, and you always see the thing go up, right? But you need to remember uh, the block uh, is already inside the water, you know. The entire block in diagram C uh, is already inside the water. So even if you push it inside some more, uh, okay. There's no, you won't get some more water coming out. You won't because the whole thing is inside already. Okay. So what will happen is it will be unchanged. The displaced water, this, this one, the displaced water will remain unchanged because when you put the object inside and let's say it sinks to the bottom. Uh, <laughs> this is very logical. Think about it. Let's say called Call, you know, you take a ball, a tennis ball, or a very heavy ball, uh, and you drop it into the water. Uh. Yes, when you drop it into the water, some of the water will come out. But as the ball is sinking, uh, do you see some more water coming out? No, it won't. Because the amount of water that the ball pushed aside uh, is dependent on the ball itself, just the ball. Okay, so make, don't make this mistake. Uh. It's a very common mistake. I see it a lot in a lot of students. Okay, they think that the deeper the object goes down, more water will come out. No, the object is inside the design already. You cannot increase anymore because the whole object is inside the water. Okay, if it is half inside the water, then you push down some more, obviously, la, there'll be more water coming out. But if the whole thing is inside already, make don't make this mistake. If the whole thing is inside already, you cannot push any more water out because everything is inside already. Yes, if you push using your hand, uh, obviously, la, can. because on your hand, <laughs> this one is logic, la, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, deep submergence vehicle is required by a marine mining company to carry out a deep sea rescue operation. Wow, the vehicle must be able to submerge and emerge quickly. Okay, so like a submarine, la. Okay, uh, travel at high horizontal speeds and carry a number of crew safely. Wow. So we want to see, uh, this is basically talking like submarine. Lah. You want to determine which DSV is the best. Okay, so submarine, just uh, this one. Lah. Submarine, uh, yeah, I think we answer this and then we do this. Lah. So the shape, <laughs> you want a round submarine or you want a streamline. Lah. Uh, the reason we need it to be st streamlined, apart from the fact that there are three choices for streamline, uh, is because we want to travel at high horizontal speeds. Okay, and streamline, usually if the answer is streamline, the reason for this would be to decrease water resistance or to overcome okay, water, uh, water resistance. Okay, so that you can travel at higher horizontal speeds. Lah. Okay, volume of ballast tanks. Lah. So this is the submarine and there's another layer over here. Lah. Okay, this is where all the people are. Lah. La, 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 la. Okay, all the people here. But, oh, uh, you know, the submarine has another layer where all the tanks are here. Okay, this is a very crude picture. Huh? It's very rough, lah, but it gives you the idea. So the ballast tanks are in here. Okay, the ballast tanks are in here and you know the ballast tanks like a hole like that. Nah. So when you open the hole, then all the water go inside. Nah. Okay, then when you're, when the water go inside, the submarine become heavier. Submarine become heavier, it can sink down easily. Nah. Okay, so that's how they control how much they sink. And so how do they float? Okay, how do they float is they open the hole and they pump out the water. So bila air kan, bila air mengisi, okay, then this becomes heavier lah bahkan. Okay, then after that, when they want to float, nah, they pump out the water, okay, so that the ballast tanks will start emptying. Lah. Okay, and the emptier the ballast tanks are, the submarine gets lighter, the buoyant force will be bigger than the weight. Okay, so whenever we talk about submarine, it's always a the battle nah, between the buoyant force okay, and the weight. And the only thing that you can change uh, is the weight. You cannot change the buoyant force because the buoyant force depends on the volume of the submarine that's in the water. If the whole submarine is in the water already, then the buoyant force is maximum already. You cannot do much about the buoyant force, but you can change the weight. 
But how do they change the weight? The ballast tank. So we want a bigger or a smaller volume of ballast tanks. Obviously, we want a bigger volume of ballast tanks. Lah. Okay, we want a bigger volume of ballast tanks so that uh, you can produce, sorry, produce a bigger weight. Okay, to help sink the, not submarine, uh, DSV. Okay, DSV more. Okay, produce a bigger weight to help sink, uh, kasi, kasi tenggelamkan lah. Okay, the DSV even more. Okay, so that's why we want we would use a bigger ballast tank. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, number of pressurized air tanks. Okay, so as I said just now, uh, open the hole in, inside the water, they, they open the hole, they have to pump out the water lah, so that the water will leave the ballast tanks. So in order to pump out the water, they will need all these pressurized air tanks. Okay, so we want to have a bigger number of pressurized air tanks. Okay, so you can say uh, to increase the efficiency of uh, pumping out water. Okay, apart from that, okay, apart from that, now the air tanks also serve as uh, air supply for the crew, okay? So you can say to provide more air supply for the crew. Okay, this is also another possible answer. You can talk about air supply or you can also talk about, uh, you know, the efficiency of pumping out the water. Okay, so they pump out the water by using air. Okay. Now, the maximum pressure we've stood. It means in the DSV, uh, they boleh tahan how much. Lah. Okay, so we want, obviously, we want a higher number. Lah. Okay, a higher number. I guess 6 is also high. Lah. Since 6.1 is considered high. Eh? But why do we want it to be able to withstand a maximum pressure? Okay, so that okay, the DSV can go deeper. Okay. If you can tahan a bigger pressure, it can go deeper because the deeper you go, the more water pressure there is. Okay, so the best choice for this would be choice B. Lah. Although the maximum with pressure we stood is only 6.1, it's not as high as 7.5, but it is streamlined shape. Lah. Okay, nobody wants this round shape. Lah. Round shape yes, is very weird. Okay, because we wanted to travel horizontally. Kalau kita mahu turun ke bawah, maybe round shape is better. But kita mahu pergi horizontal. Okay, so so jangan confuse lah with what you see in the movies. Movies kan dia biasanya bulat makan, so dia mahu turun ke bawah. But this one we wanted to move horizontally. Okay, alright, last question. Oh no, not the last question. This is the explanation of how this happens. Ah. Diagram 10.2 shows a person pushing a ball below the surface of the water. When the ball is released, uh, the ball rushes upwards and out of the water. Wow. <laughs> okay, so explain how this happens. Huh? First of all, uh, when the ball is pushed into the water, okay, it displaces displaces the water. Okay? So when you push the ball in the water, it will displace the water. Okay, they are kind of this one. Lah. So this produces a big buoyant force. Okay? According to Archimedes principle. Okay. Dia tolak air, menyebabkan buoyant force. The buoyant force pushes the, uh, the buoyant force pushes the ball up lah. But wait lah, just a minute lah. <laughs> buoyant force is always there. Okay. But the reason why it goes up is because the buoyant force okay, is bigger 
than the weight of the ball. Okay, the buoyant force is bigger than the weight of the ball. And that's why finally the ball you know travels upwards. Huh? Or you can also say, uh, of course, another point that you can also mention is that the ball is less dense than the water. Ini pun akan menyebabkan dia naik. Okay, this will also cause the ball to go up. Okay, so you can write these four points down uh, as the explanation. But because this whole question is about Archimedes principle, Okay, you kind of want to stick to the Archimedes principle. Talk about when it displays the water, you create a big buoyant force because the whole ball is inside the water already. And so a lot of water is being displaced. So a lot of water displaced means you provide a you produce a big buoyant force, and the buoyant force is the one that pushes the ball upwards because the buoyant force is bigger than the weight of the ball. Okay, okay. Refractive index are uh, one point five one and two point zero five. So the incident rate is sixty, uh, and the refracted rate is thirty five and twenty five. Okay, so what is the meaning of the refractive index? So refractive index is the uh, ratio. Okay, ratio of speed of light in the air to the speed of light in a medium. Okay. Uh, this is the standard one. Uh, I think I remember telling ST uh, that you can also say that the refractive index is the ratio of sine i to sine r. This is the textbook definition. Uh, but I would say this is also a possible answer. Okay, you can say the ratio of sine i to sine r because the formula is n equals to sine i over sine r, which is a ratio. Lah. Okay, the ratio of sine i to sine r is the refractive index. Okay, now compare the refracted angle, refractive index, and the density between medium x and medium y. Okay, so just to note, uh, this is 1.51, 2.05. Okay, so refractive index, we can see it. Lah. Uh, 11.2 is bigger than 11.1. The refracted angle, this one, 11.1 is bigger than 11.2. Okay, density between medium X and medium Y. Okay, there are different densities. Uh, okay, and how do you know which one is more dense? Uh? The one that is more dense is the one with the smaller refractive angle. Smaller refractive angle uh, got actually got meaning one, you know. Over here, light travels more slow. Okay, here light travels slow. Lah. Okay, it's slow. But in medium Y, uh, it travels even more slow because the refractive angle is even smaller. The smaller the refractive angle is, okay, the slower the light is traveling, which means that the medium is more dense. Okay, more dense material, the light will travel much slower. Okay, so the density between medium X and medium Y, X is smaller than Y, or 11.1 .1 is smaller than 11.2. Okay, either way is okay. So relate the refracted angle with the refractive index. Okay, so that's the first one. So this is the smaller the refractive angle, the bigger the refractive index. As I said just now, when the refractive angle is smaller, it is more dense. So the refractive index is bigger. Lastly, relationship between refractive index and density. So the bigger the refractive index, the bigger the density. Okay, the smaller the refractive index, the bigger the density, the slower lah. Okay, the speed of light in that particular uh, medium. <sighs> okay, sorry, uh, hold on. Uh. Okay, fiber optics. Uh, uh, 
you are assigned to give suggestions on the characteristics of optical fiber so that it can be used in communications and medicine. So what are fiber optics used for? Uh? Fiber optics are like these thin strands of string. Okay, I, I, it's not really string, uh, but it's like all these thin strands of string uh, which uh, nowadays are uh, bukan satu utas saja, they are la selonggok lah. Okay, we have many, 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 many strings, then we kasi longgok together. Okay, and we use them uh, for, you know, for internet connection lah. That's why you have all these Maxis fiber, DG fiber, Cellcom fiber. It's all using the technology of optical fiber. Okay, because it has been proven uh, that optical fiber, fiber, okay, can send data much faster. Okay, through the phenomena of total internal reflection. Okay, so there is no data loss. You know, you don't say hello and then yang kau dapat adalah low, macam itu saja. Yang hair tu hilang sudah tiada. Total internal reflection. Yes, everything is transferred. Okay, another use for fiber optics is in medicine. Okay, so things like uh, colonoscopy, or endoscopy. Asal ada perkataan scopy lah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so colonoscopy is, you know, they want to see your ulcers lah. Okay. So they will take a fiber optic. Uh, it's called a scope lah. Okay. They dipanggil satu scope. But it uses fiber optics. At the end of the scope, there is a camera. And the camera will send the image. Uh, or, well, you know, gambar or whatever video that you want to take. Okay, it will send the image through the fiber optics so that you can see on the screen. Okay, so people use it to check your insights. Uh, check your butt or your, your usus besar or usus kecil. Depending on whether you masuk melalui hidung atau mulut atau masuk melalui, you know, your, your butt. <laughs> okay, but it's used in that. It is also used for... Um, Operations that don't require you to cut lah. You know, like uh, kalau buka appendix bahkan, nowadays, we just go inside. Uh, I think it's called laparoscopy. Yeah. La laparoscopy. Laparoscopy. Macam lah. Okay, so again, the word scope is there. Okay, so you just take out the appendix uh, by using lapro laparoscopy lah. Okay, sorry, I'm not a medicine person lah, but I know this much lah. Nowadays, tidak payah sudah ada, you know, potong kopia perut lah untuk kasih keluarkan to appendix. You can just do it with a small hole. It leaves a very, very small scar. Okay, but at the end of it, there's a there's a camera or there's a, there's, you know, something you can see and then you just potong from there lah. So anyway, fiber optics lah. So features of the optical fiber, okay, you want it to be a bundle. Okay, you don't want to have just one piece of uh, optical fiber. You want it to be a whole bundle. Because when you have a whole bundle, okay, more signals. Okay, more signals can be sent. Because if it's just one, you just send one signal, Nima. But if you send a bundle, you send one whole shot. Okay, so, you know, usually uh, fiber optics, fiber optics, lah, okay, are usually given in bundles. Okay, comparison between the refractive index of the inner core, he, inside this blue color is the inner core, and then there's the outer cladding. Okay, now this is a very important answer to remember. Okay, you need to remember that the inner core, the refractive index uh, has to be a bigger, this one. Okay, so the refractive index of inner core is bigger, the outer cladding is a smaller, uh, a smaller refractive index. Okay, inner core bigger refractive index, outer cladding, the one on the outside, uh, is a smaller refractive index. And the reason for this is so that total internal reflection okay, can occur. Okay. This is one of those answers uh, where already set already one. Okay, if you know, you know. If you don't know, then I'm sorry, la, you have to guess. La. Okay, but just remember, inside is bigger, outside is smaller. Then you can get total internal reflection. Okay, flexibility has to be high. Okay, why high flexibility? Because it has to enter inside your mouth to go inside your ulcers. 
if it is so keras, uh, the moment it and masuk dalam esophagus, kamu terus dia patah. <laughs> so we don't want that to happen lah. Okay, so we want high flexibility so that it is easy to bend. Okay, dia lemah, dia lembik-lembik ya, but it is strong. Okay, so dia bukan lembik-lembik dan senang patah. It's lembik-lembik, but it's easy to bend, but it doesn't break easily. Okay, purity of inner core. So you want this inner core, okay, dia punya bahan, ha? adakah dia tulen atau dia, you know, ada kotoran atau cemaran in there. So obviously it will be higher purity lah. We definitely want higher purity so that, okay, uh, apa, less signal loss. Because when the, if let's say ada kotoran-kotoran di dalam makan, then apa-apa signal yang kamu hantarkan, total internal reflection cannot occur lah because dia akan terhalang sekejap lah. Okay, by that thing over there. So, you know, that causes signal loss. So, when your inside is pure, <laughs> wow, okay, then you have less signal loss. Okay, lastly, huh? sorry, sorry, almost done already. Additional features, okay, usually... Because we want to use for communication or medicine, especially medicine, lah. Okay, you usually would want to add a camera because you want to scope, scope, ma. Okay, so we use camera to view inner organs. Okay, kita mau tengok organ dalaman, so you have to put a camera in there, lah. Otherwise, kamu kasih masuk dia apa yang kamu tengok kan? So we definitely don't want that, lah. Okay, another thing is we we usually add a light source. Okay, satu sumber cahaya. Not a torch light lah, but you know, at least ada lampu kecil lah. Why? Because your inner organs inside your body is very dark. If you put a camera inside but there's no light lah, apa lah yang dia mau tengok makan. Okay, so the purpose of the light source is to get a brighter image. Okay? Uh, apa, yang, apa yang saya cakap? Uh, fiber optics, uh, fiber optics is a pretty famous question, lah. Okay, uh, pretty famous light question, and I think you both of your classes have heard me say the same thing, uh. Every year I will predict, <laughs> I will always say that, oh, okay, this year astronomical telescope is coming out, but always never come out one. <laughs> so I don't know whether this year you're gonna be that lucky, lah. Uh, but I will say that fiber optics is a more popular question than than astronomical telescope. Same topic. Okay, both is under light. Lah. But I have seen more fiber optics questions compared to telescope, astronomical telescope questions. Lah. Walaupun saya punya favorite adalah astronomical telescope. Okay, so it may be a good idea for you to study both. Lah. <laughs> okay. Or you, if you really want to try and believe me and say, oh, telescope, tahun ini lah telescope akan keluar. Okay, I don't know. Lah. Every year I say, tapi keluar satu dua kali saja, jarang keluar lah. Okay, so that's it now for this select all. Oh, sorry. One more question. Oh, dear. Okay, uh, this one. Uh, explain what happens. So the light propagates here. If the light ray at point B is, if this is 30 degrees. Okay, so this question is very strange. Lah. It, in Malay, they sudah bagi the surrogate thing. And in English, it gives a refractive index of 1.5. I'm going to use the English now. If I say the English now, they give you a refractive index 1.5, you need to count the critical angle because this is total internal refraction. So the critical angle is 1 over sine C. Okay, you can calculate the value of C. Lah. Okay, and you will get uh, the value of C, 1.5 equals to 1 over sine C. You will get uh, 1 over. Is uh, about 41.8 degrees, lah. slightly different from this. Lah. Okay. But what is so important about the critical angle? So, total internal reflection. Okay, let's revise this. If your incident angle is less than the critical angle, refraction occurs. Okay, if your incident angle is more than the critical angle, total internal reflection occurs. Okay. But if your incident angle is kang kang the same as your critical angle, okay, then you'll get a 90 degree refraction. That means uh, if this angle, 
Okay, if this angle over here, Astaga, okay. If this angle over here, if let's say lah, I say it's 41.8 degrees lah, I'm going to get a 90 degree refraction. 90 degree to the normal line lah. Okay, it's going to refract over here. So this is I equals to C. Okay, if it is I is less than C, if let's say this is, in this case lah, it's 30 degrees. 30 degrees is less than the critical angle. So if this is 30 degrees, what you're going to get is it's going to be refracted. And you have to remember, like, is it refracted away or towards? Okay, it's going to be refracted away from the normal. Okay, so this is case number one. I is less than C. Okay, and in the third case, if your I is more than C, which is X equals to 50, okay, X equals to 50, you're going to get total internal reflection. This is I is more than C. Okay. So I is more than C, you get total internal reflection. So you will have to explain what happens to the light ray. Lah. So explain and then say why. Okay. So number one, it will be the light ray will be refracted. And remember, make it a point uh, when you say refraction, Talk about the refraction. Is it refracted away from the normal or towards the normal? Okay, it will be refracted away from the normal. Okay, why? Because the incident angle is less than the critical angle. Okay, that is for x equals to 30. Okay, blue, uh, sorry, red color case. Lah. The incident angle is less than the critical angle. So the second one, the incident angle is now 50, which is more than the critical angle. So what will happen? Total internal reflection will occur. Will occur. Okay, why? Because the incident angle is more okay, than the critical angle. Quite an easy four marks, actually. Okay, all you have to remember is just the three conditions. Lah. If it is less than the critical angle, more than the critical angle, same as the critical angle. I have seen questions they ask, uh, what if the incident angle is exactly the same as the critical angle? I've seen this question before. Then you just say, Look, it will be refracted 90 degrees to the normal. Okay, Because the incident angle is the same as the critical angle. Okay, So it's just an additional extra. Like, in case they ask, uh, okay, in case they got asked, then you know how to explain.